because of this, they burned his books, mainly because he brought in a lot of foreign ideas, which is not a bad thing to learn what works from the non-Jewish nations. The whole basis for monotheism in Judaism was developed by the Rambam. And the Rambam brought in a lot of philosophy to really establish what God is not and what God possibly is and all these questions that were never asked before. I mean, these aren't things that our sages spoke about in the Talmud. I think I mentioned last time that monotheism in itself is really, at least according to the Peshat, not a tenant of our religion until the Rambam sort of stepped in. The book of philosophy that appears in Mor Nebuchim in the Guide for the Reflex, that's all opinion. It's opinion that I embrace, even the notion of monotheism. Sure. <laughs> I mean, ethical monotheism, I'm big on that, you know. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm referring to the monotheistic debates or the monotheistic standard that was adopted post the Horban, post the development of Christianity and almost perfected in the golden age of Spain by mainly Muslims, but for sure started by the later Geonim in whom the Rambam learned from. In other words, yes, the Torah only teaches one God, and that's Peshat. No, the monotheism I'm referring to are the more complex representations of what we call monotheism today, on the possible limiting of God, arguments against the Trinity, or even issues that later scholars had a problem with, like the Sefirot or concepts like Simsum. So, much, I would even say about 95% of what is taught nowadays and used to disparage Christianity and Kabbalah is virtually all Rambam in terms of monotheism. I don't believe that monotheism was meant to become what it has become. It didn't affect the world. I mean, it, you know, that was the Jewish God, you know, that was the, the God of the Hebrews. It wasn't when you say God now, I would say coast, I would say for around the world. If you were in colloquial discussion with somebody and you say God, it's going to instantly go to the God of Israel. Right. I mean, he's so well known now. There's no other really God really worth talking about unless you want to get into Marvel Comics, which right. is great fun. Yeah, my, on monotheism now is uh is is leaps and bounds what it was two thousand years ago, I would say. All right. So, so I mentioned last time that Rav Herschel Schechter, which is he's like the postic of the OU. He's he's one of the biggest rabbis alive today. He says that Shema Yisrael, the Neither Heno, the Neichad, doesn't really mean God is one. And I agree with his approach to this because that doesn't really tell us anything. Okay, God is one, and what? Now, what does that mean? His opinion is that it means that God is unique. Now, that makes sense, that he's unique amongst all the other false gods around him. He's different. What makes him different is that he's good. But to think that the notion of God being one is a tenet of our religion, and in some way our sages believe this. Now, I know the Rambam believed it, and there were people like the Rivid who attacked the Rambam, because according to the Rambam, most of our sages would not have a share in the world to come, because they also believed that God had a shape. You know, it says in the Talmud, God wears the fillin, God wears the talit. And the Rambam says in Hilchus Tshuva that anyone who believes that God has a shape loses their share in the world to come. Mm. I consider myself a Rambam guy, but it's a shame how nowadays that we're so quick to call anyone an idolater just because they happen not to concur with the Rambam's understanding of the complexities of God. When our sages, it seems... But not even our sages from the Talmud, even Rashi. We see Rashi in the first parak of Barashas. He says, if you don't believe in the actual Selem Elohim, like the image of God as a, an actual shape and form, you're a heretic. And many of the Tosafists also believed in corporealism, but that God had a shape. There's a good book on this by Mark Shapiro called The, it's called the Limits of Orthodoxy. The Limits of Orthodox Theology, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a shame that now, because of the Rambam, and I appreciate the philosophy laid down by the Rambam, but we've become, like, to just call people names, like heretic, idolatry. I made a video against the Sefirot, the ten emanations of God, but I never called it idolatry. I call it foolishness. This is what I don't think the Trinity is necessarily idolatry. I mean, it's foolishness. That's something that people have a problem accepting. People get stuck in what's called first-stage thinking in Judaism. It's hard for them to accept that something could not be idolatrous and not be heretical and still be wrong because they need a name to call you or a way to insult you. Instead of saying, no, okay, you can believe in this certain idea 
it's not against or for the Torah. I mean, it may hurt you in the long run, but it's not necessarily heretical. It's not necessarily idolatrous. You know, I hear like Mizrahi and this guy Yaron Rubin, all these guys, they're just quick to call everyone idolater and men or, or you know, apicorus. Well, what's kind of funny is if you actually go back through the rabbinic literature, the only reason we have a frame of reference for what a min or an apicorus is is because the Rishonim kind of developed those con- – they're, they're mentioned in like the Mishnah and things like that, but they're not very clearly defined until right. centuries later. So it, it's – it's still opinion literature in many cases. Min clearly comes from Arba meaning, right? It just means like species. In Tamil Yerushalmi, it's never used to refer to like a heretic. It's a later developed idea, right. you know, because back then they weren't so quick to just toss everyone under the bus. This is why, I mean, I believe that even back then heretics were, or like what we consider heretics nowadays, were embraced like brothers. It was only later on in the time of the Amorayim that people started throwing everyone under the bus who didn't align themselves with that form of Pharisaic Judaism. This is why I don't believe that Messianic Judaism is really a form of idolatry either, because Judaism is a lot more colorful than that. Torah is a lot more colorful than that. Rabbeinu Bakia ben Peku, the, the author of Duties of the Heart, you know, he writes that God would not condemn someone who takes a passage in Torah literally. It's like, for example, anyone who reads the Torah straight through is confronted with instances where it seems like God becomes a man, you know, and that's just undeniable. So the Rambam steps in and then he says that anytime that happens, it either happened in a dream or it's not really saying that he's a man. And I, and I accept that. But what I don't accept is someone condemning someone because of a lack of philosophical expression to be able to articulate themselves in that manner and just came to the conclusion that, you know, God can become a man. Do you really think God is going to condemn someone taking you like the Torah literally? It says uh, God himself is a Ishmil Chama, a man of war, and that God brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand. These things are literal. Now, I accept the Rama's opinion, but people have to acknowledge how much of what Judaism is today was invented by the Rambam. And he had to because he was amongst monotheism junkies. That's what I consider Muslims. You're just like I consider Christians Messiah junkies. I consider Muslims monotheism junkies. I was talking to a Muslim the other day, and then the guy told me that the reason he's not Jewish and the reason he thinks the Torah is corrupt is because in the Torah it describes Jacob wrestling with God. Yes. And then he says, a pure monotheistic God that would not have included that in the Torah. So then I told him that the notion of monotheism was a developed idea amongst the sages, amongst the judges and the rabbis. They developed the idea and they packaged it in such a way that they were able to hand it to future generations, but not for some future generation to discount the Torah because of a later developed idea. They're tearing down the path laid down by our sages because now the Torah doesn't match the picture or the platter the sages handed over to us. Christianity is similar, at least some streams of Christianity, because clearly the notion of the Messiah is also a developed idea. With the notion of Messiah, what doesn't literally appear in Torah, there could be like a foreshadowing here and there, right? But because of this developed idea, Christians or some Christians broke away from the source, from Torah, and in some cases believe that they're above the Torah now, they're saved by grace, not by works, because of a developed idea. In other words, they grew out of the shell that provided them with this idea. Yeah. You can't, it, I mean, it's, you can't expect hmm. anything less, can you? No, I mean, we really. have to be a little more open-minded. We have to be a little more humble than that. That's why I get pissed off when I see people protesting to remove a statue. The reason we have freedom today, okay, fine, Thomas Jefferson had slaves. These guys, they're the founding fathers of this country. They gave you the, the ethical backbone to break away from England. And now... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. But when you Sugar? say the ethical background, we're, we're talking about enslaved people. So right, okay. I, I, I struggle, I struggle with that a little bit. I am not saying that 